Uh, today, we are very happy to invite Professor Jessica Carter to give a lecture in the, in the event on mathematical philosophy at the Peking University. Uh, the, <clears throat> the title of uh, Professor Carter's uh, presentation is, uh, as you see it, Diagrams and Free Rights in Mathematics. I think this is a really interesting topic. <clears throat> so before the lecture, let me give you a very brief introduction to our professor. So I just asked, <clears throat> he was born in Sweden, is, is a Swedish, and uh, he's now working at the Department of uh, Mathematics and Computer Science at the University of uh, Southern Denmark in, in Denmark. And her research fields, <clears throat> as uh, it, uh, she puts it in, in her website, is, <clears throat> is among the intersection area of, um, of a few uh, fields, which includes uh, philosophy of mathematics, uh, history, uh, and the practice of uh, mathematics. Uh, <clears throat> so last week, Professor Colin McLarty gave a talk in the same uh, series, and he, he, he said something like, if one wants to work in this, the field of uh, uh, philosophy of mathematics, then it, is, it would be better if he or she knows both philosophy and working mathematics uh, very much. Uh, then you can, as a philosopher, you can easily uh, communicate with the mathematicians uh, and uh, the other way around. I think Professor Carter is actually perfect uh, in this uh, aspect. So she got her, as far as I understood, uh, her bachelor degree and a master degree in both uh, mathematics and the philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> then after that, she got her PhD in mathematics with the, with the thesis whose title is Ontology and Mathematical Practice, which is also uh, um, in the, yeah, <clears throat> as far as I read it, it's also uh, in the combination of uh, uh, philosophy and the mathematics. <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, we discussed this a bit before the lecture. I think, yeah, yeah. I personally think this is a really interesting phenomenon for, uh, for, for, for human beings, for the intellectual activities. So I'm really expecting, ex expecting this talk uh, okay, without further ado, uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's welcome our professor to uh, get started. Um, thank you uh, very much for this introduction. And uh, uh, first, I also wish to thank the organizers, in particular, Zhang Jingwang, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so the main topic of my talk, uh, concerns the use of diagrams in mathematics, in particular how, um, how and why they lead to mathematical uh, discoveries. In other words, how free rights occur in mathematics. And this uh, topic belongs to what can be referred to as philosophy of mathematical practice, which in some sense is similar to mathematical philosophy as it was coined by Burton, Bertrand Russell. So although Russell warned against the use of figures in mathematics, here is a nice um, um, connection to the uh, uh, title of this lecture series. So my talk consists of three parts. First, I will say a little bit about mathematical philosophy and philosophy of mathematical practice. And then I'll give some background information about work in the philosophy of mathematics on use of diagrams. And then there is the main part which concerns diagrams and free rights in mathematics. So let us start. Um, so the term mathematical philosophy is according to Aldo Antonelli coined by uh, Bertrand Russell. It appears as the title of his work or his book, Introduction to Mathematical uh, Philosophy that was published in 1919. Mathematical philosophy was part of a general movement referred to as scientific philosophy. It arose as a reaction to 
towards the excessively speculative and metaphysical character of post-Kantian German philosophy. Um, the orientation is usually dated between 1850 uh, until 1930, and some of its adherents include Helmholtz, Helmholtz, who is said to be one of the first who used the term around 1850, uh, but also Hilbert, Carnap, Husserl, and Heidegger. And looking at the list of these names indicate that scientific philosophy um, covers a wide range of uh, approaches to, the, uh, to this field, uh, which is also, by the way, the case for the philosophy of mathematical practice. What unites them is that the, uh, the idea that philosophy should be based on the methods of science, uh, but there is no general agreement what uh, science uh, or the methods of science uh, amount to. So in the hands of Russell, mathematical philosophy focused in particular on the foundations of mathematics. And when doing so, he urged that uh, mathematicians pay attention to the most recent fields uh, or work in mathematics in these areas. So he mentions in particular the work of Piano, Didikin and um, Cantor. And in general, he advised that uh, previous methods should be replaced by the formal logic and analysis of concepts which are components of analytic philosophy. Today the term mathematical philosophy is not widely used, um, but uh, it has been used uh, by Aldo Antonelli in uh, the introduction to a special issue of Tupoi in 2001, where he characterized mathematical philosophy as the area of philosophical reflection that is contiguous to and interactive with mathematical practice proper. Just, I'll do some change here to my slides. Um, today, uh, the term philosophy of mathematical practice is more widely used and uh, so it also covers a wide range of approaches to the philosophy of mathematics. What un unites them is the focus on mathematical practice, although there is no agreement on what practice uh, means uh, in these approaches. So I just here listed a number of different uh, contributions to this area. I will not go through what, what they are, but if you wish, you can look them up uh, after my talk. Um, so after this very short introduction to <laughs> mathematical philosophy and philosophy of mathematical practice, uh, I will go to the main part of my talk, namely the use of diagrams in mathematics. And the main topic concerns how visual representations contribute to new insights in uh, mathematics. And you see here a sample of some of the diagrams that I will show to you during the talk. So in particular, I will focus on the phenomenon of a free ride as it has been analyzed by Atsushi Shimojima. A free ride is uh, the property of some representations that whenever certain pieces of information have been represented, then another consequential piece of information can be had for free. Uh, and you see an example here of if you represent or present or draw a circle and then another circle, the consequential piece of information that comes for free is that these two circles uh, intersect in a point. And so I'm going to see or investigate in to which extent this phenomenon, the phenomenon of a free ride occurs in uh, mathematics. Uh, but before coming to this main part, I'll give some introduction uh, to the role of diagrams in mathematics and focus here on some points that will be relevant for the main part. So diagrams have played a an important part of mathematics. This is in particular true for mathematics as it was done in ancient Greece. A number of scholars have studied the role of diagrams 
uh, including Braville Nets, who in his um, The Shaping of Deduction concludes that diagrams in Greek, math Greek mathematics are metonyms for their propositions. He bases this claim on a number of observations. One is that both uh, textual information and information from diagrams are essential components of deductions. Another observation is that in Euclid's element, each proposition is accompanied by its unique diagram. To illustrate this claim, let us consider proposition one in uh, book one of the elements. The topic of this book is uh, plane geometry. So after having introduced the definitions, the postulates and uh, axioms, proposition one tells us how to construct an equilateral triangle on a given line segment. And here is the diagram that comes with this proposition. And so let us look at the demonstration or part of the demonstration. So uh, AB is the given line segment. And then you start by drawing a circle with center A, AB as radius like this. You draw another circle with center B and AB as radius and then uh, like or like this and then you observe that a new point pops up that you name c and then you join a by c and b by c and you see you have now constructed a triangle the the next part of the demonstration shows that the line segments formed are indeed uh, identical so that you have an um, equilateral triangle So note the following. Uh, so for example, the, uh, or first that the intersection point uh, that you get here is not, does not follow from the given information. It is something that is read off from the, from the diagram. On the other hand, when demonstrating that the line segments are in fact identical, this is something that is inferred from the information given in the text. Uh, note also that this is the, our first example of a free ride. Uh, the consequential piece of information that we have for free is had when we draw first this circle and then this circle. It's the point, uh, intersection point of these two circles. Note also, thirdly, that uh, it is beca partly because information is read off from diagrams that the elements have been uh, criticized afterwards. And it's well known that the structure that is building mathematics on definitions on uh, postulates of the element has served as an inspiration uh, and even the ideal for how to present mathematics and uh, theoretical sciences. Um, but even the, uh, the geometric content uh, of the elements has influenced how mathematics has been done that proofs should be based on geometry. And this is also the case, for example, in the early history of analysis. In the 16th century, for example, mathematicians designed a variety of methods to determine subtangents, tangents, uh, extrema in areas under curves uh, based on uh, properties of geometric figures. So here's an example from Fermat, who sh here shows how you can determine the tangent to the curve AC here by uh, noticing that what is had obtained here are two uh, similar triangles. Also a bit later, Newton uh, bases his reasoning on uh, figures. So here's an example where he also determines the tangent to a curve by using properties of similar triangles. But slowly during the 18th and 19th century, uh, diagrams slowly disappear from mathematical 
text. This is also the case in analysis where, where mathematicians realize that, that geometric intuition is unreliable, for example, because it's possible to uh, define nowhere differentiable but everywhere continuous uh, functions. But this is also the case in uh, geometry. So one project was to remove diagrams or not read informations, information as was done in Euclid uh, from in geometry text, replacing this information with postulates as was done by Pasch and Hilbert in the end of the 19th century. Uh, and this is, uh, the quote here is a, a general example of, uh, of, of a opinion around the turn of the 20th century. Often one focuses on the last line stating that uh, the theorem is only truly demonstrated if the proof is completely independent of the figure. For the purpose of this talk, I would rather like to focus on what is said in the middle namely that a figure is a fruitful tool to discover such relationships and constructions. And since this is a lecture series <laughs> with title uh, mentioning Russell, I think he should also be heard in this case. Um, so as mentioned, uh, he was interested in the foundations of mathematics. And I think this is the reason uh, that he warns against the use of uh, figures in this quote, stating, for example, that the best books, the, in the best books, there are no figures at all. Uh, but later we shall see that in uh, contemporary mathematics, there are still figures, perhaps not always as the basis for uh, drawing inferences, but as tools for mathematical discovery. So after the focus on foundations in mathematics and perhaps inspired by Hilbert's formalist programs, logicians today, and perhaps even some mathematicians find that only proofs that are formulated as symbols, symbolic expressions in a formal language are acceptable. And here is uh, an expression by the logician, uh, Neil Tennant of this view stating that diagram is dispensable as a proof theoretic device. Indeed, it has no proper place in a proof as such. So to sum up on uh, this part, uh, we've seen that diagrams should be banned from proofs since we read off information that do not follow from the postulates. I mentioned in analysis, it was found that geometric intuition may not be reliable. And also a danger is that accidental properties can be read off from a given figure. And so uh, a little bit on the recent discussions on the role of diagrams in philosophy of mathematics. So at first the discussions uh, mainly were whether, or on the topic of whether uh, diagrams can be used to obtain rigorous proofs and certain scholars have argued that this is in fact the case. Um, we have Ken Manders who have, uh, has defended the use of diagrams in Euclidean plane geometry by introducing the distinction uh, exact versus co-exact properties. And a co-exact uh, attribute of a diagram is a condition that is unaffected by continuous deformations of the diagrams. So just to give you an example, um, for example, in the proposition one of the elements, if I draw the circles really badly, I've con continuously deformed them, they will still intersect in a, in a point. Um, and this is an example of a co-exact attribute of these figures. And Mander's point is that in Euclid's element, only such properties are read off from diagrams. Uh, exact properties, that is the identity of line segments or angles are always inferred from information given in the text. So. 
And there are other authors also showing that diagrams play a justificatory role in contemporary mathematical practice, for example, Corfield in higher abstract algebra and the Toffoli and Giordino in low dimensional topology. But recently, the focus is also on many other roles diagrams uh, play in mathematics, for example, for con concept formation and understanding. And here I can mention the work of Jatinto, uh, Rina Sarikova, and my own work in this area. And then it is in particular this last role that is the interest of this talk, namely posing the question, why are figures or diagrammatic representation fruitful tools in mathematics. So, um, yeah. so after this uh, introduction to the work in uh, on diagrams in mathematics, we turn to the main topic of my talk to analyze why certain diagrams in mathematics leads to discoveries or why free rides occur in mathematics. And so the main tool to respond to this question here is taken from Atsushi Shimojima um, and partly Keith, Sten uh, Keith Stenning. Uh, Shimojima introduces some properties of diagrammatic representations to, re to explain why free rides occur. I will use some of these named nomic constraints uh, over specificity in order to see whether they also explain uh, the currents of free rides in mathematics. I also consider another feature formulated by Stenning called agglomerative reasoning. And I will tell you what they are in a minute before coming to these examples. And so after introducing this framework, I will show you three examples from mathematical practice, through two from contemporary mathematical practice and one from more historical. So the first example uh, is from free probability theory where mathematicians uh, represented permutations by diagrams, which led them to realize or, or see or discover new properties and relations between these uh, properties. In the second example, uh, I will consider Riemann's definition of a complex function uh, by representing them in a plane, which made him uh, able to uh, visualize this defining condition of being a complex function. And in the last example, uh, I will which is from uh, operator algebra, I will consider C star algebras that can be uh, generated by directed graphs. And by doing this, easier calculations become possible. And then at the end, of course, some uh, conclusions. And so uh, at Shimojima, he finds that a free ride is a characterizing property of graphic representation. He introduces uh, this uh, term or property together with other properties in order to distinguish between graphic and linguistic representations. And similarly, Keith Stenning introduced a different, a different proposal for how to distinguish between what he refers to as diagrammatic versus sentential representations. And uh, note that uh, both Shimojima and Stenning uh, do not work in mathematics or philosophy of mathematics. They work in uh, information and visualization theory. And this also means that many of the examples that they uh, show are not from mathematics. They are usually from logic or they are models of linguistically presented situations. So it, from the outset, it's quite clear that what the picture that they present may be a bit different from the one that I'm interested in. Uh, note also that I will not be interested in uh, introducing a way to distinguish between diagrammatic and sentential representations. That's not my purpose here. And so, and also about terminology, I will uh, consider diagrammatic representations. I will not use graphic versus linguistic representations. I find diagrams is, uh, is a better term for what we talk about in mathematics. 
And so the way I characterize uh, diagrams or diagrammatic representations in mathematics is that they are representations formed by diagrammatic elements, uh, that is these visual uh, elements such as line segments and possibly arrows. Also diagrams hold the potential to exploit two dimensionality in a non-trivial way. And finally, the way we interpret these uh, figures or representations does not depend on a fixed reading di direction as when reading this text, which is from left to right and top to bottom. I will return to these characterizations of a diagram or diagrammatic representation in the end, because they hold a key to explain why certain diagrammatic representations are fruitful in mathematics. Uh, and so, in addition to the free ride, I will consider following distinctions between diagrammatic and sentential representations, uh, nomic versus stipulative constraints, over specificity versus general, and agglomerative versus discursive reasoning. And Shimojima, in his framework, argues that nomic constraint is the most fundamental property of diagrammatic representations because diagrammatic representation will have nomic constraints and they uh, uh, implies uh, free rights and over specificity. So according to Shimojima, nomic constraints is the most fundamental um, property of diagrammatic representations, but we shall see that this is not always the case in the examples that I will show to you soon. But before coming to the examples, I will uh, introduce these terms. So in order to uh, uh, tell you what free ride constraints, agglomerative and discursive reasoning is, let us consider uh, the following two uh, propositions and their proofs. So consider the first, where we have three sets, A, B and C, and it uh, the proposition states that if A is a subset of B, B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C. In order to prove this, we can represent the conditions by so-called Euler diagrams, that is uh, circles. And the general rule here is that when I draw a circle marked by A, then I intend all the members of A to be inside this circle. And following these instructions to represent A is a subset of B means that I draw a circle marked A and then a circle marked B containing the first circle. Looking at the second condition, B is a subset of C, I draw a circle marked C containing the circle marked B. But then after having drawn all these uh, circles representing the given information in the conditions, I see that the conclusion follows. That is, I, I can read off in the diagram that the circle marked A is contained by the circle marked C, so that I conclude that A is a subset of C. And notice that here is a consequential piece of information that comes for free. When I have represented the conditions, the conclusion uh, follows from, or follows for, for free. That is, uh, we have a free ride occurring in this case. Notice also that there is a constraint holding on the representation that is these circles that I have drawn in the plane. Uh, the constraint is that if I draw a circle marked A and a circle marked B containing it, and then a circle marked uh, containing these two circles, then necessarily A is inside of C. And so this is an example of what Shimojima calls a constraint that holds on the representation. And this constraint is based on topological properties holding on the plane, uh, namely uh, uh, the containment uh, relation, that the containment relation is transitive. And which, by the way, also corresponds to the fact that the subset relation is transitive. 
So in this case, we have a, a nomic constraint holding in this representation. Finally, note that this is an example of a, an agglomerative proof. Uh, an agglomerative uh, representation is when you add information or given information successively to the same representation, which you do in this case. And this is also the reason why I can have this free ride or read off the consequential information. Notice, uh, consider now the, the second uh, proposition with its proof. Um, this is a discursive proof. And in this case, nothing comes for free. Uh, I will, the, the proposition is that if you have uh, integers p, a and b, if p divides a and b, then p divides uh, any linear combination between the two numbers. I will not go through the proof, but I claim that all inferences made in this proof depend on stipulative rules stating how you can manipulate the signs. So for example, consider the step uh, from here to here. And this step, step is, uh, depends on the distributive rule uh, telling me that if I have P here and P here, I can put it outside of the parentheses. So in this case, uh, only in all inferences that are made are based on stipulative uh, rules, which means that uh, stipulated constraints govern in this case. Notice also that it is a discursive proof. Uh, all the information given is repeated in each instance uh, of the proof. And the final uh, property of uh, diagrammatic representations that I mentioned was over specificity. So this is the proof that I showed before. Uh, consider now some other conditions. So suppose I know that A is a subset of B and A and C are disjoint. So I represent this first part as before by drawing a circle marked A inside a circle marked B. And then I try to represent the second condition, namely at, that A and C are disjoint. So I draw a circle marked C, which has no elements in common with A. And so far so good. But if I mark here by the red X that something is both in B and in C, then I overspecify the given information or the representation over specifies the given information because I draw some conclusions in this representation that there is something in B and in C that do not follow from the general situation or this situation that I am represented. And in this case, I draw some diagrams that over specify the given information. So um, I have here some textual uh, description of the, these properties. I will not read them all. Maybe you, you can do it yourself. But we had the free ride, which characterized that a new consequential piece of information can be read off from an external representation. We had the notion of constraints, which can be both nomic or based on stipulated rules. This was the contrast between the Euler diagrams and this, the discursive proof. And then we had the property of over-specificity, which characterized the phenomenon that it is impossible to represent information graphically without representing it in a certain way. This was when I drew the red cross, uh, that there is something in the intersection between two sets, which did not follow from the uh, represented situation. And finally, there was the distinction between agglomerative reasoning and discursive reasoning. So, so now coming to uh, the mathematical examples, and I shall 
show you that free rides do occur in mathematics and they do so in multiple ways. I, as I said in the introduction, new properties of concepts appear, a condition is visualized and easier calculations become available. I will argue that even though there are sometimes free rides, they are not always free sites. I will uh, explain what this means during the presentation on the examples and also at the end of my talk in the conclusions. Finally, I will also argue that the examples illustrate that mathematical free rides need not depend on nomic constraints and over specificity need not occur. And at the, in the conclusion, I will suggest some other explanations for the occurrence of free rights in mathematics. And it is here that I will return to my characterization of diagrams. So coming now to the examples. So the first example is an exemplary case. It shows that free rights in mathematics can occur in, this, in the way that Shimojima explains, that is nomic constraints apply, and over specificity apply. So this case comes from free probability theory where mathematicians uh, were working on the expression looking like this. Um, these are Gaussian random matrices, uh, which you multiply apply, and you take the trace and then the expectation. Uh, but what is interesting here for our purpose is the pi here in the indices it stands for a permutation. And as is indicated by this value of the expression, the, this expression depends on properties of the permutation uh, that the mathematicians were able to figure out by drawing diagrams, as I will show you soon. So a, uh, a permutation is a bijective map uh, from a set to itself, in this case from the numbers 1, 2 up to p. Uh, p comes from the number of matrices up here. And as is well known, uh, permutation can be represented in uh, a variety of ways, in a two-dimensional display or by cycles, as shown here. Or you can draw a circle, as here, marking points 1, 2 up to p on the circumference and then you can join the numbers uh, indicated by the values of the permutation. So here we have an example of a perm permutation pi one, which maps one to two, which is indicated by joining a line uh, between one and two and three and six, joining a line between three and six and so on. And this is another example of a permutation that is uh, represented by this diagram. So we have numbers one to eight and the same as before we join by lines uh, the numbers indicating the values of this permutation. So one and three are joined. And drawing a lot of diagrams like this made the mathematicians realize that there is a difference which is quite apparent here that sometimes the lines will not cross as in this one and sometimes the lines will cross as in this one. And also making a lot of further work, they realized that whether the lines cross or not cross affects the value of the before mentioned uh, expression. And this uh, gave rise to the notion of a non-crossing permutation and a crossing permutation. And another property that was also significant for the results is uh, that of a neighboring pair. That is when permutation maps i to i plus one, as is the case here, one is mapped to two and four is mapped to five. Um, so here are two properties that came up as free rides uh, when representing permutations by diagrams. They could also visualize a proof uh, of, of the relation between these two being a neighboring pair and ha having crossings. I will not go through the proof here. Uh, we can return to it uh, in the discussion if you wish to look at this case more. So uh, as I said, uh, free rides 
uh, in this case, a consequential piece of information that comes for free when representing permutations by diagrams is the crossing or non-crossing of the lines. That is, the property of being a crossing permutation is a free ride in this case. Also, over-specificity holds in this case. The shown presentations of permutation show specific permutations that have properties not shared by all permutations, so they over-specify the given information. But in this case, it is a good thing. The diagrammatic representation of permutations contributes to singling out an interesting subclass of permutations, that is, the crossing permutations. Furthermore, uh, it is because of topological properties of the plane that we have uh, the crossing of the lines. So the consequential pieces of information depends on what Shima refers to nomic constraints. Finally, when drawing the diagrams, we present the given information successively into a single diagram. So the representation is also agglomerative. So uh, in a, as a conclusion in this case, we have free rights over specificity, nomic constraints and agglomerative representations. Coming now to the second example about uh, functions of a complex variable. So here we consider uh, Riemann's definition of a complex function and his Grundlagen für eine allgemeine Theorie der Funktion einer veränderlichen Größe, uh, uh, which was uh, published in 1851. And here Riemann starts to consider a, a complex function uh, which has uh, this expression of a complex variable and states that it is a complex function if this differential quotient is independent of this set. And today we, we do this a bit differently. We define a complex function as just something that is given by this expression. And we say it's differentiable at set if this condition holds. So what he did was to suggest that this idea was easier to grasp when using one's spatial intuition. And so he would represent the complex numbers in one plane A like this and the values of the function in another plane B. And what he was able to show by this representation was that the angles formed here in the, the plane A is the same as the angle formed here. So that uh, phi here is identical to psi. But he did not just read off this information from the representation. What he did was instead to, to notice that whenever you have a complex number like set uh, equals x plus y i, it can be uh, represented as uh, by the coordinates x comma y, and then you can represent it as a point in the plane. And similarly, if you have set prime, which has the coordinates x prime comma y prime, you can also represent it by another point in the plane. And then you can look, uh, consider the difference between the two points, which is given by this line segment. And you can characterize it as dx plus i dy. But Riemann uh, found that you can also uh, represent it by a different set of coordinates, namely uh, as as r here as the length of this line segment and the angle the line segment forms with the positive x-axis. And it was this uh, observation that Riemann made, namely that instead of using Cartesian coordinates, you can use polar coordinates to characterize the difference between two complex numbers that allowed him to calculate that the two mentioned angles are identical. And so coming now to the conclusions about this case. So the free ride that is obtained by representing a complex uh, function is that certain angles are identical. Uh, that is that the uh, complex function are what is referred to as angle preserving. Uh, 
um, that is, so the uh, condition of being a complex function is visualized. Um, but what he actually uh, reads off, he does not read off, as I mentioned, that the angles are identical. What he does read off is that when representing complex numbers in the plane, uh, geometric ob uh, objects uh, pops up. And he notes that the difference between two complex numbers can be characterized by polar coordinates. And so the question is, does over-specificity apply in this case? And that, of course, depends on what one reads off from the given representation, whether one reads off that the angles are identical or whether that a coordinate shift is possible. And what he does read off, uh, Riemann reads off, is that co a coordinate shift is possible. So uh, information that over-specified, the given information about complex function is, is never read off. So over-specificity, I argue, do not hold in this case. Um, there is a link here to uh, what I referred, uh, talked about earlier, Ken Mander's distinction between exact and co-exact properties. So what is read off in this case are what Manders would call co-exact properties, because no matter how badly you would draw the, the, the diagram and present the complex values, uh, there would still be a difference the, or the difference between these complex numbers would still be possible to characterize by the, the length of the line between them and uh, an angle between them. The exact property of the identity of the angles is not something that is read off. And uh, of course, in this case, there are nomic constraints. Uh, once you represent the complex numbers in the plane, all these geometric objects uh, appear, that is line segments and angles and geometric figures. So there are certainly nomic constraints governing this case. And notice also that information is added successively in the same uh, diagram or the same plane so it is also an example of agglomerative representation. Coming now to the final uh, example, which concerns uh, C star algebras, uh, which you can define as objects in operator algebras. So having general definition of C star algebras, uh, uh, define a whole class of different C star algebras and one interest of mathematicians is to classify them, that is telling uh, the different classes uh, of uh, C star algebras up to isomorphism. And an important tool to do that is to calculate two K groups, K0 and K1, uh, as invariants of them. But unfortunately, to calculate these two K groups based on the original definition is quite complicated. But recently it has been found that certain C star algebras can be generated by so-called directed graph, which are objects looking like this. Uh, and the advantage of this uh, is that you can read a, a directed graph in a different way and they give rise to a linear map. And from this linear map, it's also very easy to calculate these two K groups. And so a directed graph is a uh, four tuple. It consists of vertices like this, V1, V2, V3, and some edges like these. Uh, and since it's a directed graph, each edge has a direction. So for which is given by this range and source function. Uh, the source of this one is V1 and the range of it is V2. And notice also that Usually it's um, easier to uh, present a given directed graph by a diagram like this, but you can also describe it discursively as I have done here. I will not read it to you, but just to point out that you can present a given directed graph both, both by a diagram and discursively. 
And this is an important point that I will return to in a minute. And so, as I indicated, having a particular directed graph, you can read it in one way, the vertices and edges gives, gives you generators and the way the edges are placed between the vertices uh, gives you relations between the generators and then they generate a particular C star algebra. But you can also read the, this directed graph in a different way and it gives rise to a linear map. And this is an expression of the linear map. I will not uh, read it through. Those of you who know linear algebra may uh, see what it does. But the point is that once you have read off this linear map, which is very easy, uh, you can calculate K0 and K1 as the co-kernel and the kernel mm. of this linear map. And if you had a undergraduate course in linear algebra, you will be able to calculate these two and determine the linear map from, a, uh, from an arbitrary directed graph. So it's very easy. And just to show you how easy it is, I'll just very quickly go through uh, a simple example or not all details, but just indicate some of the calculations that are done. So this is a very simple graph. It has one vertex, it has two edges. It generates what is referred to as the Kunz algebra, uh, named after the guy who was able to uh, formulate many of its properties. And calculating the linear map in this case is just by one line. So, and you, the result is that it is just B. Uh, if you calculate the kernel, uh, K, which gives rise to K1 group, it's you see it's zero immediately. Uh, you calculate the co-kernel uh, in a just very few steps and you also see that it is zero. So this is all the calculations that are needed to calculate C, uh, K1 and K0 for this um, particular sister algebra. And just to give you an idea how complicated it was before. So Kunz was able to calculate the, these two K groups uh, before it was possible, or it was found how it could be generated by this directed graph. And it was considered so difficult that it's published in one of the most prestigious journals in mathematics, the Annals. And so some conclusions about this case. Um, so this case illustrates that we can have free rights that do not depend on nominal constraints and do not give rise to overspecificity. The free ride that is uh, that occurs in this case is once you have presented a given graph algebra by a directed graph, uh, then you have the consequential piece of information that can be read off is the linear map. And the fact that you can read off the linear map is something that is given by a general theorem. So there is a general theorem that ensures that whenever you have a uh, directed uh, graph, then it generates as a particular C star algebra and uh, you have also access to the linear map and so the K groups. I also claim that over specificity does not hold in this case what is read from a particular directed grass graph uh, depends on stipulated rules. These rules assure that what is read off follows from the given information. And I also claim there are no nomic constraints uh, in this case. The free ride uh, does not depend on physical, geometrical, or um, topological properties of the directed graphs. It is independent of how we choose to show the graph. Uh, remember that a graph can be presented both discursively and agglomeratively. So here we have a case where we have free ride, but it does not depend on nomic uh, constraints or uh, over specificity uh, does not apply. And so here is a general overview of uh, 
my conclusions for these cases. You may notice there is a fourth example here. So what I present here is um, based on a paper that is under review where I include a fourth uh, example uh, from category theory. But as you see, here is the general picture. So I noted that free rides occur in all the examples. Um, but as Shimojima argued, then nomic constraints would um, be the most fundamental property of diagrammatic representations, but we see that this need not be the case. So uh, at least here we have no nomic constraints, but we do have a free ride, or so I argued. Uh, he also argued that if we have nomic constraints, we would have over specificity, but this need not apply in mathematics. And I should remark that in mathematics, we're not very fond of reading of information that do not follow from the uh, general situation. Um, and this was also one of the criticisms that I mentioned for Euclid's elements that we read of information and the general danger of reading of accidental properties for diagrams. But it seems mathematicians uh, control the way they read of information from diagrams so that they do not overspecify the given information. Also notice that a property that holds for most of the uh, representations is that they are agglomerative. Uh, in graph algebra, I noted that we can present the directed graphs both agglomeratively and discursively. So looking now at the conclusion, it seems that the free rides that I have shown to you do not follow the pattern as argued by Shimojima. So the question is what governs the free rides in mathematics? And one part of the answer is uh, noted here, the fact that we use agglomerative representations in mathematics. So um, as this is what I just said, um, so I think one part of the explanation for why free rides occur is in mathematics is that information is added successively to the same uh, representation. It's, it is the possibility of showing all relevant relations of a given concept to other concepts in a single display. And this is made possible because of the two dimensionality of diagrammatic representations. But this property did not explain all of the uh, free rides in mathematics, as we see in this last case. Uh, so the question is, what is it that makes uh, the free ride possible in the example of the graph algebra? And here, I would say that it's based on the possibility of multiple readability, uh, which is possible because there is no fixed reading direction of a particular directed graph. And also these directed graph have no natural interpretation, which makes it possible to uh, say that it can, a, a particular directed graph can be read in two different ways. In one way, it gives rise to the uh, sister algebra and in the other way, it gives rise to the uh, linear map. Finally, a uh, comment about the free rides not being always being free sites. So even though properties may pop up, their significance uh, may not be immediately given. So I mean, intend this in two sense or in, in two ways. So in one way, uh, as may be clear from the examples that I showed you, uh, often an interpretation is required. Uh, so for example, in the last case, uh, it's not immediately significant when I show to you a directed graph, what I intend you to read off from the directed graph. In order to, for you to know what to read off from a directed graph, I need to tell you uh, the rules or the ways you are supposed to read it off. And uh, perhaps th this is a more uh, simple example. Even in the simpler example of the Euler diagrams, 
we need an interpretation, we need to know that set inclusion is uh, shown as a containment in when representing it in the plane. So in the vocabulary, vocabul I cannot say this, in using the terms of uh, pers persistemiotics, uh, they are uh, iconic metaphors. In a second sense, um, of why uh, free rights are not always free sites. It's because further work is required to see how they, uh, con the free rights affect the considered results. I mentioned this in my first example of the representations of the permutations. I noted that even though you immediately can see that the lines cross or do not cross when you represent a given permutation, it's not immediately significant that this actually has uh, a value for the, the case you are interested in. So further work needs to be done in order to see that uh, the crossing permutation actually has an effect on the result. And this was it. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I've listed a few references for those of you who are interested in uh, reading more about this. Thank you for this uh, really interesting talk. Now we can um, <clears throat> have some questions. So Yenjin, do you see? Uh, so I actually have some uh, <clears throat> questions. If um, yeah. So so maybe I just ask you the, the first the simple question. <clears throat> so when was the paper? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting talk and. Uh, <laughs> Really enjoy your presentation. So the, my first the simple question is that when was the paper published in the journal Annals? Annals. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I can. I have. I don't know if I have it. Um. I guess. Uh, let me just see. I have some references in the paper here. Mm. <laughs> no, I um so so the graph algebras were they were starting to publish papers on them uh, in the 19 1990s. So it was before that. So maybe I, my guess is uh, in the 80s, 1980s or something. Yeah. So uh, that's also yeah. somehow quite recent. I mean, that's really. Sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, yeah. That's also very impressive. So um, um, I think that if you have a question, so um, mm. yeah, you can either uh, type it, uh, type it in the in the chatting room, or you can. Um, so for the panelists, you can just uh, speak it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, okay. uh, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Jing, go ahead. We have uh, quite some questions, but uh, let, let me ask uh, a uh, rather general one. So I, I'm really thinking on um, many of your examples are actually showing that different representations of the same thing can make really big difference. But of, of course, in this talk, you'll, you'll focus more on the uh, diagrams representations. So I'm wondering how much of this ex uh, discussion can be generalized to various forms of uh, representations. Like, uh, I mean, in, in logic, um, you also sometimes have uh, like uh, symbolic normal forms for certain things. And uh, when you change things into normal forms, you start to see uh, some patterns show up and you can easily um, derive certain, say, consequences or read off to some extent consequences, uh, but it, it's not really a, a diagram kind of form. So I'm wondering how much of this kind of a discussion can be generalized to various of uh, representations. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, this is a very big <laughs> question and a very interesting question. Uh, and I'm, I'm certainly also interested in um, 
for example, notation in general uh, and how it affects uh, what you can see and looking at the history of mathematics, it's certainly clear that um, the way notation has been introduced affects what, what you can see and what you can do and and um, it's, it's a huge topic. Uh, I'm currently also writing a paper about this with the Dirk Schlimm, whom I saw as one of the participants, but I don't know oh. if he's, he's still there, but um, yeah, yeah. yeah let me put him. So Dirk, uh, right? Yes, Dirk, uh, yes. yes. Yeah. But, but men, many other are, or maybe not, it's, it's, it's starting to become more and more popular to consider uh, things like this. And, but sometimes people make uh, claims that are perhaps a bit too strong uh, in, in this direction. But, it, but it's certainly clear that it, so if, if you consider a mathematical text, ancient text, uh, or, or maybe not so ancient, where, where you don't have uh, much uh, notation, um, it's much harder to, to see what is going on and notation really helps. Um, so I have students working on reading historical papers and then they really start to appreciate this mathematical yeah, yeah. symbolism. Um, yeah, so, speaking yeah. about this uh, notation thing, I think I, I can add some sort of Chinese uh, flavor because I was, I, I discovered at some point some kind of uh, uh, a modern translation of Western algebra book into Chinese. You know, we have a long history of uh, sort of a mathematical thinking and some theory and we prove some theorems, but in, in the traditional Chinese culture, I think there is something uh, not so, uh, uh, how to say, so, I mean, the, the language we use or the symbols we write, the characters, are sort of stopping us from developing some very abstract mathematical theory. As an example, uh, for example, in algebra, you use uh, variables, right? You use uh, those symbols like X, Y, Z, or something like that. But uh, for example, in this translation I mentioned, so they, they try to use Chinese characters for different variables. But the trouble is in, you know, in Chinese language, every symbol has its meaning. It's not like X, Y, Z, it's completely arbitrary stuff. But in this translation, X, Y, uh, Z are translated into heaven, uh, earth, and human. And then you have all these equations like uh, three human plus uh, the two heaven equals to uh, some earth. And you have this group of equations in terms of this. I think this is really bad for us to develop some kind of, uh, 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 say, say ab abstract mathematical thinking. I think notation really matters, especially this X is missing actually in, in, in Chinese, uh, say, mathematical uh, thinking. Uh, yeah, I think it matters. Yeah, uh, this is just a remark. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. A very uh, interesting remark, but... Um... So, but I have maybe two comments. So one is uh, that maybe um, maybe the Chinese characters have some other advantages. Uh, mm -hmm. And another comment is that I think the fact that X does not have a meaning, but, or well, it has a meaning now, uh, if, if you know mathematics, right, namely it's right. an unknown, but that's also something that is culturally uh, or has come by, by culture over a long period, I guess, because a, a, a danger when using a usual letters is also that you accidentally write words. So if you write a long string of, of letters, then maybe you, <laughs> you <laughs> come to write something. But, but when you do mathematics, you need to abstract from whatever uh, comes to be written. Um, I guess, uh, so yeah. that's part of learning mathematics. Um, yeah. And I, I also was once told a story that this is why mathematicians like to use Greek letters instead of uh, the, the usual letters. Yeah, exactly, because then it's easier to 
not think about what you actually write, but well, whether that's true or not, I, I, I'm not sure. So. Okay. okay, thank you. So Professor Young, I think that now you can ask your question. Okay, uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, one is uh, in the earlier part, you mentioned uh, you talk about concept formation. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example for that? Uh, my second question is, have you considered animations? Because with computer graphics, sometimes you can really see the movement of things, uh, which sometimes help the mathematical thinking. Uh, have you considered that as part of the graphic, uh, uh, what, whatever? Uh, I mean, you can really move the points on the plane and see whether the, the lines, whether points form a line or, or, or whether something is on a circle and so on and so forth. And, yeah, yes. Uh, okay. uh, did you That's have my question. More? Yeah. No, okay. no, no, no. Thank no. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the first uh, concept formation uh, is um, so for, from this example with the permutations. So what I claim, and I, I've written a paper about it, is that the concept that is formed, well, it takes a long time. Concept that is formed is that of a, a, con, a crossing permutation. Oh, okay. So you have a new concept that is formed based on drawing or uh, representing uh, permutations okay. by, by diagrams. And also the, the concept of being a neighboring pair. So that okay. is what I mean by uh, concept formation. Uh, and I guess it happens uh, a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the uh, computer graphics, uh, I, I, I have not worked so much uh, with it, but uh, there is also some other area in uh, mathematics that I'm interested in, namely exper experimental mathematics, which is a, a bit the same. And, and I know you, you can use uh, computer graphics in doing mathematical experiments uh, in, in a variety of ways because it's so useful to visualize things so you see what, what goes on. But yeah, I only worked a little bit uh, on that so far. So, Professor Liu, yeah, I saw that you unmuted yourself. That may, uh, maybe you have a question. If you, you do, please ask it here. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so, Thank, thanks very much for your talk, and it's really, really illuminating. I'm sorry, as an amateur mathematician, and uh, I understand the importance of, you know, uh, the reasoning um, by, you know, this kind of a visual kind of uh, reasoning. But uh, so for, uh, so I want to make a point and to, 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 to point out uh, something, even sociological kind of a relationship that we know that in mathematics, you know, and uh, I was told that when we come to reasoning and 70% of our, uh, you know, uh, brain power are used for pictorial kind of reasoning instead of uh, analytic reasoning. But when it, come to, uh, it comes to write down proofs, right? And uh, so for, for instance, write down proofs for uh, mathematical journals, we have to write in analytic and a linear kind of a form instead of, you know, and put on a, a pictorial kind of a reasoning. So this is part of it because it's a conventional. And I also noticed this is just, this is in, in the area of mathematics in, in philosophy. So when it comes to philosophy of mathematics, you know, and uh, so, for a part of argument, and uh, you can easily write down some mathematical symbols, not just the pictures, just as, you know, just a symbolic kind of a, a representation of some mathematical reasoning. But the practice is that philosophers usually will translate it, you know, into English and write it in <laughs> linguistically. So this is a kind of a parallel kind of a <clears throat> comparison between the two area in mathematics and even though mathematicians reason um, pictorially, but when they come to write down um, proofs, they do it symbolically. But in philosophy, when it comes to reasoning of about philosophy and mathematics, and instead of writing down, you know, 
uh, mathematical equations, they, they will usually translate into English. So I think it's a partly is a conventional and a partly is a sociological kind of uh, division. So I was wondering <laughs> about your opinion as to to what extent that it is about it, it is about communication kind of uh, uh, needs um, for experts to communicate with one another instead of just like an individual um, reasoning in their private time and uh, think about you know very um, deep questions using either in mathemat mathematicians case pictures or in philosopher's case in equations things like that so is there like a communicational kind of a point to make uh, at this point, yeah. Thank you uh, for your observation. Um, I liked very much what you said about first that much of the brain uh, functions pictorially and, and, and visually. And so, um, yeah, I, I think uh, it's it's a very interesting area to to look at also about perception theory and and how that helps us. Uh, although I I do not know so much about it as I would have wanted to. But, um, and also a, a comment: I do not know how uh, philosophers translate mathematics and mathematical proofs so much, but I I know perhaps a little bit about uh, mathematicians, and I I guess I agree with uh, what you say. Um, and also looking at this example again with the permutations. So I I told you that the mathematicians drew diagrams like this one. And they also drew. Uh, other types of diagrams in order to come up with, with this particular value. But in the papers, there are no diagrams in the published papers. Um, so there they have a formal algebraic uh, definition, what it means to be a crossing permutation. And they also have a diagrammatic presentation or a formal algebraic presentation of what it means to be a neighboring pair. And also this proof that I, I didn't go through it, but you can do the proof. And they did the proof at first by drawing uh, pictures like this. But in the, the paper presenting the results, it's uh, written uh, algebraically or formally using the translations of these notions. Um, and I guess there are several reasons for that. One is uh, sociological conventional, that you cannot present uh, things in mathematics journals uh, by drawing pictures and explaining from the pictures, even though maybe it, it would be more or easier to understand if, if they did so uh, sometimes. But it's, it's the way you're supposed to present results in, in mathematics journals. Um, Yeah, now I forgot what it was <laughs> uh, going to say. Yeah, but, I understand. Uh, so for, for yeah. instance, for like uh, <laughs> on professional mathematicians, when they communicate with one another, so they sometimes, for instance, in topology, they can just make some hand gestures mm -hmm. and they understand each other. So that level of communication is is not presentable in mathematical journals, for instance. Yeah. So part of the reason I think is because of uh, the, so because mathematics is a, such a precise yeah. science that, that they don't want ed, any ambiguity. And uh, you mentioned in your talk that, you know, for graphs and uh, to, to work and uh, it needs interpretation, right? So you need to translate what being said in this diagram and uh, into, uh, professional language. Mm -hmm. So maybe I was wondering if this is a part of the reason that you know diagrams are not accepted as a proof and uh, on the like the, let's say a mathematical journal level but um, informally and uh, it's totally fine uh, within an, a mathematical community informally. Yeah. Yeah actually that was the second point that I was going to make. Uh, the, the precision of the mathematical language. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's another reason why you would want to 
uh, translate something given by pictures into the formal uh, mathematical not 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 necessarily formal logic, but in in the language of mathematics, because only there, doing the calculations, you can convince yourself that you are actually right. So you you're thinking about uh, a lot of things in your mind, and and you have an idea, and you think you can work it through, or you you think you have a proof. But in order to make sure that it is actually a proof, I guess most ma mathematicians would want to actually write it down in every detail, convincing yourself. And that's easier. And also because your brain capacity, mathematics usually would fill a lot of your brain having all that in your mind. But once you write it down on paper, you can free your mind and only pay attention to a little bit, a, a small piece at a time, and then uh, forget about all the rest that you convinced yourself uh, about and, and then calculate or reason uh, and then you can go through the whole thing uh, one step at a time uh, making sure that you are in fact right so mathematical language certainly and the things that you can write down certainly has also great advantages or in in mathematics okay so professor uh, cutter so there's still a question in the yeah. in the okay i see the question yeah, I found something uh, before. Uh, so you, you tap the yes. so called answered question. I think maybe you can see, see uh, it. Yeah, I hear maybe. Yeah. Oh, answer question. Answer. Yes. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait, saying or something. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm not very good at pronouncing Chinese. Um, Um, so with the problem of over specificity, do I think diagram can play the role of a proof independently without the help of discursive explanation? Um, it depends. <laughs> uh, no, yes or no answer. Uh, sometimes yes, um, but or maybe most of the time, I guess, uh, you need some kind of uh, discursive discursive explanation of how to read uh, read the diagrams because only very simple cases uh, like when when the diagrammatic representation really resembles what you want to uh, represent then they may may then the diagrams may explain themselves so i'm thinking about examples in uh, in geometry for example in in uh, euclidean geometry where you draw things like uh, triangles and circles uh, that are in perfect presentations of what they actually represent uh, there, perhaps, you need not always have explanations of what they represent, but most of the time in mathematics, I guess, you need some explanation of uh, what goes on. Um, so, yeah, I, I know there are certain scholars arguing that you can have diagrammatic proofs, no text whatsoever, but I think that only rarely happens. Um, Okay, so we still have a couple of minutes for questions. So if you have questions, you can either put them into the chatting room where you can, uh, if you are a panelist, you can just uh, speak out. Um. Uh, can I ask another question? So, yes. yeah, actually I'm, I'm very interested in your category theory example because uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, as you also probably know, there is this uh, using uh, a certain uh, category theory to understand the uh, quantum mechanics, like uh, mm -hmm. in, in Oxford, they have this uh, group building some kind of uh, category theory for quantum mechanics using pictures uh, as mm -hmm. reasoning. Do you know that this uh, Bob Cook um, uh, quantum mechanics for kindergarten? <laughs> so that the uh, because many. Uh, proofs uh, uh, in category theory are um, commuting certain diagram, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you can make it that more uh, intuitive for even um, 
people who are not that familiar with the whole mathematical theory, but they can understand the diagram and how to commute or this and that. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, whether that's, so what would you say in the category theory example, more or less? Well, uh, yeah, I, I didn't, uh use the, this example because it's somewhat involved and it needs more explanation that's, than oh, some of right. the other examples. So this is why I, I left it out. But uh, that is also a special uh, example showing that uh, maybe in some ways there are nomic uh, constraints because you do use these visual things to navigate in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and the example also exploits um, uh, the commutativity of diagrams. Mm -hmm. So, but but it's quite difficult to find the right diagrams so that you can use it for to navigate. Mm -hmm. In the end, in my example, um, but it it doesn't over specificity doesn't apply because in, in category theory these uh, arrows they form the the notation. So it is the diagram is the part of the notation in this case. So they're not really like diagrams and you have the danger of accidental re or reading of accidental information. Um, so and I, yeah, I think it's, it's a very uh, nice uh, example. So. Okay, thanks. There's there so many things in category theory that you could, could look at. <laughs> so. yeah. And also in computer science, they use uh, all kinds of diagrams a lot yeah. in the state transition yeah. machines and all these. And uh, actually, I also want to get back to uh, Liu Yang's uh, question, I mean, about this culture thing. So uh, my understanding is that, I mean, mathematical proof, rigorous proof is for checking the correctness, but not to really deliver the idea or, or say, let you understand things. So in in many cases, I, I find it's easier, much easier to listen to a talk by mm -hmm. someone than reading his or her paper. Mm -hmm. uh, because in the papers, I mean, even there are some explanations, but the, all the things are just symbols and logic follow uh, one after the other. But uh, in the talk, you can explain, you can draw pictures, you can explain the ideas. But somehow, I find it also tricky that if you make something look too simple, then it's partly hard to publish. For example, the, your, your this uh, C star algebra example, if people discover this simple diagram <laughs> representation, maybe you cannot publish in the in the in the annuals, right? Um, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I was addressing. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I was addressing the differences between, you know, on the one hand, we have a mathematical understanding, mathematical reasoning, but uh, on the other hand, we have a mathematical communication. So for other people to understand what you are trying to express. So I, I gathered that, you know, a diagraphic kind of reasoning is very, very central and, and important for mathematical reasoning and mathematical understanding. But when it comes to communication, mm -hmm. and uh, because of the fact that we need to give interpretation of these diagrams, so we need to somehow need to communicate with other mathematicians or philosophers. So, so this kind of uh, you know differences and uh, makes diagram as less important, which is not it should not be the case because uh, it's uh, so illuminating and uh, and. Um, and, and also it's my speculation in the past and that we don't have to like, we don't have the, uh, we don't have the, the tech, technology to publish diagrams, you know, easily in books, you know, let's say the 19th century, 18th century. So, so it's easier for people to just, you know, um, type on uh, English or Chinese for that matters. And instead of a drawing, uh, making drawings, but uh, I I hope in the future, you know, diagram will be becomes uh, become like a formal language. It's a part of uh, the formal proofs, so, so to speak, and uh, and it will be more acceptable. So you already see this in uh, natural sciences. I mean, now there are like companies. 
producing very illuminating, uh, say, uh, 3D animation or, or graphs for, for, for natural science works. I, I think maybe the mathematician will also need some kind of help. Uh, although we already have a lot of tools like those ma Mathematica or things like that. So, yeah. It's, but, it's, yeah, it's also growing easier and easier to uh, to write yeah. drawings in in LaTeX, but it's, yeah, still yeah, it, it takes some time. But but it's uh, <laughs> but it's getting easier uh, to do it uh, because mathematicians also value uh, a good diagram, uh, I I guess. But also the point of making presentations, you're absolutely right. Uh, but I I think it's disappearing a bit now uh, with when you make a mathematical presentation. So before mathematicians would stand in front of a blackboard and you would draw something. And sometimes I went to talks where you mathematicians only drew one drawing. So a, a geometry or geometric object, and then he talked and talked. Uh, but now many mathematicians do slides and uh, then it, it disappears a bit. I think this more intuitive uh, or these intuitive talks because you just present the results and partial proofs and, and such things. So. Okay, I think we, <clears throat> yeah, time is up. Perhaps we just uh, stop here. Uh, let's thank our professor again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this wonderful uh, presentation. So, so every panelist is invited to join the, the, the social event after this presentation. I think there is a